Another twist in the tale that is season 2024 after a couple of top four fancies falter. Incredibly, just two games separate Carlton in second place and the Hawks in 13th. Brisbane's charge continues. Are the pies cooked? And what's the Bombers' biggest concern? This is Access All Areas, thanks to Crypto.com. Great to have your company on this Monday. Damien Barrett and Matthew Lloyd join me. And Damo, as I mentioned off the top, it is a ladder logjam right now. And the Pies find themselves in 12th. That lost to Geelong on Friday night. Jeez, their premiership defence is hanging by the balance. Yeah, it is now. Their aura is gone. I mean, that loss was their third in a row. And the one prior to that was a, a one-point win against North Melbourne. That famous game where they were nine goals down. So their form is really, really poor. One way to get it back, Saturday twilight against <laughs> Hawthorne at the MCG. That, that's their, going to be their last hope to, to rejuvenate this season. So if we take a look at that game on Friday night, Geelong had 139 uncontested marks. It was an interesting style of play. Let's take a listen to what both coaches thought of the tactic. There aren't many secrets in the competition. You sort of think, you look around and that there, there's definitely a way to play them. This is the thing we weigh up. You go, so for three quarters, it was, it didn't hurt us. You know, there was no scores, from, well, well, relatively low scores from that phase. But then there's the potentially a cost of energy. Um, whether we got that right or not, it's, that's something we'll reflect on. Let's bring Lloyd in now. How did you see this tactic? Was it effective on Friday night? That, uh, Collingwood love high pressure, high octane games uh, and the Bombers and also the Cats have taken that away from them the last two weeks. Let's take a look at the numbers under Craig McRae. So they normally last year when they won a premiership they averaged 92 marks against. It's jumped up to 101 but the last two weeks has been 139 and 145. 145 is the most marks he's ever conceded as a coach. 139 was equal second. So this is where I reckon they've got to get back to. So striking distance. So you've got to be within striking distance. So this is Jamie Elliott, where he kicks this amazing goal. That's where you need to be. You need to be close enough to tease them to want to kick there, but then close enough where you can strike and then punish them and kick a goal. But as the game wore on, we talk about the fatigue that sets in. They are too far off. So I'm not sure what Joe Richards is doing there. He's in no man's land. And that's a domino effect after that. So then it goes to Humphreys. What's still side bottom doing there? So again, th that's not teasing distance. That's just guarding grass, which is hurting Collingwood. Like you look at Frampton, Darcy Moore, they're guarding grass a lot. So this is another play. So we talk about, you know, Joey Richards wasn't tight enough. Again, that handball is given. And what's the domino effect? Like Pendles, I'm not sure what that is. You've got to be up on your man there and pressure up, a finger in the back stuff. He gives a handball, goes inside forward 50. The captain who's doing it time and time again, that's not good enough. So layer after layer after layer, that is happening to Collingwood where they're being exposed. And then this one, I'm not sure what that is guarding. Like, and they're too good Geelong players. So Mark Blixar's on his non-preferred, gets that ball out the back. They are irrelevant, guarding nothing, and then it goes inside forward 50 for another entry. So that is a concern for Collingwood. We talk about lost their aura. Uh, they've got a, I think he's got to get his strategy right also, Craig McRae. It's a great illustration yeah. of what you yeah. see as a major mm. problem. You've been worried about them for some time, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Uh, I remember talking about it a month ago, the way they're playing, thinking uh, this side could miss the finals. This was four or five weeks ago. So I just think that they they play patchy footy. They get up in moments, drop off in moments. But I think they've been decimated by injuries. But... Backline, they're playing blokes that shouldn't be playing AFL footy and they've got some makeshift forwards who shouldn't be playing AFL footy either. So it's just one of those years for Collingwood where they're just not good enough. As we sit here right now, so Hawthorne on Saturday, Twilight at the MCG, then Richmond, Carlton, Sydney, the Lions and Melbourne. They're 12th at the moment. Do both of you have them making finals? I don't now, Nat. I, I was prepared to hold on them, but uh, I, I do now just remove from my thought processes they are the reigning Premier. I just look at a team that's really struggling. It's only won eight games. I know there's 36 Premiership points attached to their form, but two of those results are, are draws to make it to 36. So I've seen a team that's won eight games. I like Hawthorne this week too, and then that would spell the end of Collingwood if they lose to the Hawks. All right, we will wait and see with Collingwood, a developing story as the next few weeks continue. Let's talk about Port Adelaide now. They lost to the Gold Coast, but the big story out of this is Jason Horn Francis, some undisciplined free kicks that were given away, and this was his coach, Ken Hinckley, after the game. Jason's a young player and he's learning all the time and he's got he's got to be better than he was today in, in some moments. There's no doubt about that and we won't we won't accept that that's that's okay, but he's learned a lot, but he's still got a lot more to learn. And I think that's, 
you know, I think that's clear when you've got a, a young player who's developing. He's a he's an aggressive player who who seeks out body contact sometimes. And once you let the oppo get a look at it, they they tend to come after you a little bit more. Jace is learning to deal with that, and he has to get better. So he conceded four free kicks, gave away a 50-metre penalty, didn't touch the ball in the first term, finished the game with nine disposals. Lloyd, you look at Ken Hinckley here having a word with him. What did you make of this? And what about Port's other leaders on field? Should they be saying something? It's a good point you make on Connor Rosie because he, he's not much older than, than these guys. So Butters has had a, you know, some, a lot of undisciplined mm. moments. Uh, he gets sucked in a lot, gets frustrated. But he's, uh, Rosie's one year older than him. And he's probably three or four years older than Jason Horn Francis. So, uh, yeah, I didn't feel comfortable being captain until I was 28. Mm. So I, I look at these guys sometimes and say, are they not ready? Are they too young to challenge that behaviour? Uh, it was petulance from Jason, like no, no doubt about that. Uh, big game, everything on the line, and I thought it was a huge distraction for Port Adelaide. And, and the other thing that's obvious in a round 18 match, mm. Lord, is it going to be something? Do you feel that he's going, now going to be subjected to for the remainder, not just of this season, but career? For sure. I'd be getting under his skin this week yeah, because uh, he, he was a distraction for Ken and the team yesterday with the way he played and handled uh, the close attention from the Suns. From a Suns perspective, I think Damien Hardwick, their coach, would have been pleased that they grew up a little bit in this match and they can be, continue their unbeaten run at home. Demo and they're 11th on the ladder, 9-8 yeah. and eight now, but they had some good pressure too. They did, and, and I think to your referencing there of the, the comments he made previously, yes. they would have been stronger internally than they were even publicly, and all you can do is respond, and they did. Now, they've got another away match this week against a good team in the Giants. Let's see how that looks, but I thought they controlled this game when they needed to, particularly late when Port kept surging, but their system stood up. Uh, staying in Queensland right now because the Brisbane Lions, what an interesting story. They come into this round seventh on the ladder on Sunday morning before the game. They're ninth on the ladder. And then at the end of the round, they're in the top four. So they've managed to claw their way back into contention here. It's been quite incredible, Lloydy, what they've been able to do. Yeah, they're, they're a too talented side not to be uh, in the top four, uh, top six. Uh, so it was a bit of a shock uh, with what was going on uh, with them earlier in the year. But uh, they've won the games they should. I don't still think they're playing amazing football. No. Um, so I'm not sure they're the top two, top three. Uh, they're fourth on the ladder where they're sitting, but I still think they have to improve a lot. You can line up their leadership with what we just spoke about with Port Adelaide. They've had it holding together. Lockie Neal particularly, we'll have a look at him in a moment. Um, the game started obviously not with the farewell officially to Adam Simpson. They did this quite well, mm. didn't they, the way uh, he addressed the, the players and the crowd uh, pre-match? Yeah, I'm not sure he wanted the attention, but this was Adam Simpson pre-game. We'd just like to thank you guys for your support over the last 11 years. It's just been an amazing run. Uh, we've had a lot of success and how good was 18? Um, <laughs> But we've, uh, we've also had some hard times as well and um, can't thank you guys enough and show enough appreciation the last 12 months. Uh, you've stuck by the boys, you've stuck by me. Thanks for everything. Um, let's get on with it. Go Eagles. An official line there drawn on the Adam Simpson era at the Eagles. They were more than competitive contextually on the season itself. They had some high moments. They kept challenging. Equally, though, the uh, the Lions, when it had to be done, were there for it. And there was uh, Oscar Allen, who's just emerging, re-emerging auto from a serious injury again that he's had. But uh, he's going to be there forever. Look, the, the emergence of this guy on screen here, Kai Lohman, mm -hmm. I think it's been a real positive for the Lions this year. And he, he stands up in big moments. He does. And they're the number one uh, offensive side over the last six weeks. So that's back, but they're defensively, that's where I think they still need to improve. So they're ranked about sixth in that area. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, they're a good property. Them and the Giants I want in the finals mm. because yeah. they are powerful tied. But look at the run home for Brisbane. So we'll see just how good they are at the Gabba against the Sydney Swans this weekend. That's one of the games of the season. Yeah, huge test, isn't it? Now, the Wounded Ds upset the Bombers on Saturday night. They kept their finals hopes alive. It was really disappointing from a Bombers perspective. They now fall out of the top four. And let's take a listen to coach Brad Scott after the game. They pressured us around the ball pretty well and and got across to the contest, which was that sort of night. It was a, a sort of ball on the ground, slippery, get across to the contest sort of night. And they did that better than us, which um, which is really disappointing. 
Yeah, once it started to rain, I think uh, Melbourne would have liked that. They're, they're tough. They're, they're, but the Bombers, I'd like to say, are getting better in that area with Caldwell and Durham. But this, this performance by Rivers and uh, Pickett and Biney, uh, the guys, season campaigners, I think they taught the Bombers a lesson in this game in, in, in many ways. It's through necessity, isn't it, that Rivers has got his chance in the yeah. midfield order with the uh, absences of Vitraka and Brayshaw prior to the season starting, Oliver's form being a problem. He's emerging as a, as a genuine midfield talent. Yeah, it's amazing when you get opportunity what can happen to you, uh, Nat. And, and I think an issue for the Bombers is we, we've, Peter Wright was subbed out, mm. so you've got the talls that are a problem, but also the smalls. Like, I, every team's got two or three smalls, and I, this is the leading goal kickers across the competition. You see Sydney are ranked two and three. Uh, you know, Tyson Stengel, you've got Close, and you've got Myers, are brilliant players for Geelong, whereas the Bombers, I think, Guelphie does a good role, but Jade Gresham hasn't quite given the Bombers what they hoped for as that small forward this year. I mean, they've won two of their last six games mm. now, the Bombers. Is that their biggest concern, their forward line for you? Yes, and and again, they haven't beaten too many sides in the top eight. Uh, they've been beaten by Carlton, Geelong and Melbourne in mm. the last four weeks. They've only won two of their last six. And even the Collingwood win they had yeah. last weekend, it's maybe not as good as we thought at the time because Collingwood finished that round yeah. out of the eight and we've just written them off now. So, yeah, so But still have the draw to, to play finals this year. Yeah. Another team I can't get a read on is the Western Bulldogs. They have been hot and cold all season, but they got their ninth win of the year against the Blues. It was an excellent match this one and the dogs really set the tone demo in the first quarter they did not and again we would talk about responding to adversity and, and they came off a really really bad loss the previous week against port and they were here they had some own uh, issues norton still unavailable uh Trelaw, a late withdrawal yeah. from the match itself but just didn't matter and they were able to control it they saw jamara eugle hagen have one of his better games certainly one of his better halves i mean even just darcy's coming up to the ball they're the spark that waitman has always provided i know you've been rap on him yeah. but jamara eugle hagen that the four goals he kicked um, it may be the, the coming of age game for him that we've all wanted. And Jacob Wiedering looked like he had the, I guess, the rub of the green early on Jamara, but uh, the way that the dogs responded in that second half was excellent. It was. Once they got the ball to ground, like uh, Riley West is electric. He's one of those best small forwards in the game at the moment with the pressure that he brings and the goals that he kicks. The, the talk around the dogs, though, is they actually perform better when one of those tools goes out. Mm. So, yeah, whether it's a Darcy that's out or a Norton that's out, they actually go better because Waitman plays as a tall as well. And when they're all in, they all get in each other's way. So that's something they've got to think about in the run home. And the Dogs face Geelong this mm. weekend at GMHBA Stadium. So cannot wait for that game as well. Just on Carlton, did Michael Voss get it wrong, Lloydie, do you think, at the selection table? Because when I saw the teams come out and Mark Pittnett's there, I'm thinking, geez, well, Tom de has been going so well. Yeah, I wouldn't be Mark Pittnett's favourite person, that, because I've been talking about this for most of the season and that uh, there's only, you know, most Ruckman love just being the number one person. Uh, and this was the form. When he became the sole Ruckman, these were his numbers, Tom DeConing through rounds 11 to 17. Uh, and he was ranked one in every area, just about in the game. And this was the weekend. So look at the drop of centre bounce attendances when you share it. Went from 26 to 11. His clearances went from an average of nine to one. And his score involvements went from seven to one. Mm when he was the best Ruckman in the comp for six Huge. or seven weeks. So surely those numbers are, are there to go with the one Ruckman. Any concerns, Damo, for the Blues or just a little blip? Look, they've lost by uh, a couple of goals last week yeah. to GWS, a couple of goals again this week. No, but they are conceding big scores too in those games. So that, that's their concern. And the Weedering is carrying something quite serious in that, in that way that it's affecting him play. Time now for our crypto bold play. And this week, it's the spellbinding goal from the wizard in Tassie. And so much has been made of Nick Watson's inaccuracy in front of goal, Lloydie. But the fact that when his team needed him to step up, he was able to kick this clutch goal, it was quite incredible. Yeah, you, you fluctuate in confidence as a player. But what I like about Nick is, you know, he, he doesn't do that. He just keeps at it and at it. And he just keeps wanting to take the shot. He doesn't shy away from it, uh, considering that record that he's got with you know, points compared to goal so yeah, he's, he's a high energy player who's only going to get better it was a great win for the Hawks yeah, it was. because you know a top four fancy in Fremantle I know it's down in Tassie which is mm. a bit of a fortress for them now but um, it was really good no, I loved it and I love what the captain not for the first time did though by moving himself or at least asking his coach to move him forward yeah. after he was unable to perform to the way he'd like in the out in the first early, half Damo. they were outmarked early yeah. and then look at it later I mean we'll see Newcomb come involved here and, and they're able to just scrounge away find a way Brennan Cox taking that particular mark but this is a beautiful tap here from Meek to, to Newcomb which 
help them uh, retrieve that 10-point deficit. And then the big key play was this one. Again, a guy with a bad shoulder. He's uh, taken a mark against Jackson and Ryan there, Sicily. Shoulder and, looked and fine. Shoulder looked fine. And so too to the score after he kicked that, his third goal. And uh, just, again, the leadership that he displays is something very special as to what the Hawks are doing this year. So the Giants notched up their 10th win of the season, albeit against Richmond at the MCG yesterday. Lloydie... The handball game was up and running. Is this a game style that you think will hold up come September? Uh, not for me. So I'm calling them the handball happy giant. So so you've got to, once you're out, you've got to kick it. Just like that. So that one's fine. So we just saw. But this is the one I don't like. And this is as a forward I would blow up if this happened to me. So this is when he's out and you can see the field. This is when you kick the footy. You don't invent. Jesse Hogan's out. He's, he's pointing out the back or Riccardi. That may be. But then... They, they sort of hacked that ball forward because it was one extra handball and they get away with it because it's Richmond, but they will not get away with that against the better sides come finals time. So they've got to rein it in about when to handball and when to kick. The giant skipper in Toby Green, Damo, has been out of form. It has. Probably for most of the season, yeah. to be fair, but found a little something yesterday. His best game of the year, four goals of the year and the, the ratings attached to the performance were huge. I, I still temper the, I suppose, uh, assessment of it, Now, given the yes. opponent. Now, I, I know that they tried hard and they, they pushed the, the Giants to the, to the end, but... Yeah, let's, uh, let's see it happen against a good team um, in the coming weeks. But uh, absolutely best performance for the year for Toby. Well, they're sitting in seventh, so let's see if they can make it to September. As we mentioned, of course, that ladder log jam is going to make it very, very difficult for all teams involved. Time now for Quick Hands. Lloydie, first one to you. Did Riley Philthorpe's performance make the decision on Tex's future easier? Well, I think maybe even trickier, Nat, because uh, to weigh up what to do, because uh, I'd, I'd th give Tex another year, but okay. maybe if they think Phil Thorpe can kick 50 next year, they go without him. So I think it's a line ball at the moment. One for you, Damon. Will Simpkin and McDonald remain captains of North Melbourne next year? Uh, Simpkin, yes. McDonald, I'd be surprised. And I'd also refrain from rushing Harry Sheasel into that leadership position, which is inevitable, but not next year, which will only be his third year. Nat, I like this. I hope you did too. <laughs> Paddy Cripps turning down the chance to be chaired off in Game 200. I loved it. I yeah. love that he was just salty because they hadn't got the win. Charlie Curno, I hope, was apologising for kicking three goals, seven to his skipper because they might have won the game and he might have been able to cheer him off after. But I liked it and he's such a champion, isn't he? Yeah. Patrick Cripps and what he's been able to achieve so far. Let's hope uh, a grand final is on the cards for them. Is the race now on between Goulden and Warner for the Brownlow demo. Uh, they'll get three, two or one vote, the two of them. At some stage of the round just mm. gone, but Heaney's only missed the one game that. It's still the, the, tro the box trifecta for that uh, for that particular club. Lordo, uh, West Coast, uh, did they drop the ball in not picking up Lawson Humphreys? Ooh. 100% they did. He was in their academy, the Nick Nat Nui Next Generation Academy. So how Fremantle and West Coast both missed him and he gets to the Cats at around that pick 70. What a pickup! He looks a star for Geelong. Uh, for you, Nat, to move over Adam Kingsley. <laughs> is Ross Lyon the strongest coach in the <laughs> AFL? Cuddly Ross yeah. is dead and buried, I think, at this point of the season. And I love how he tried to fix that <laughs> phone. Now, they actually fixed it at halftime, and then I think it went to handset heaven uh, in the second half. Uh, Ross Lyon probably needs a stress ball, <laughs> a la Adam Kingsley. All right, crypto.com leading uh, tip a a tipping board. I can't even speak anymore. Ross you can't is tip. No, I can't tip, <laughs> and I can't speak right now. Uh, the tipping leader board, I didn't tip Hawthorne, so that was my problem, and I tipped the Bombers. So. 40. Seven. One, a, one a week, I can claw back on Damo and I'm a chance. <laughs> That's the A. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought so. All right, that is all we have time for on Access All Areas this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next Monday. Join me, Cal Toomey. And me, Riley Beveridge. Every Wednesday on Gettable, the definitive source of everything you need to know for player movement, trade, free agency, draft and contracts. Watch Gettable every Wednesday or catch it as a podcast wherever you listen.